Hi there, this is Self-Critical Automaton, and this is episode something of my Bayonetta Let's Play. It's the start of chapter two, so before we get started, I want to jump straight into the gates of hell, um, which, you know, is a phrase I'm probably going to be saying a lot. Take care of my babies, will you? Some people may have a thing for the 45s, but to me, these are the real works of art. So that was a reference to uh, Devil May Cry, because this is the same director and it's the same kind of game, and it, I think it might be the same studio, I'm not sure. And um, yeah, the main character of that game is basically the same kind of combatant as, as the main character of this game, and uses 45 pistols. Uh, I don't think there's actually anything I want to buy, I just wanted to check if there was anything new, but I don't think there is. Very few of these are actually useful in my in my opinion. And uh, I'm just going to save up the rest of my cash. But those lines when you enter the shop, as far as I can tell, are randomised and most of them are references to other games. So, let's actually start now. Uh, there's probably more cutscenes I can never remember. The design intent for this game is kind of, what's rad? If someone at some point thought something was rad, let's include it in this. Let's just have it be complete nonsense, but in a good way. That's kind of what I was talking about previously with regards to a total lack of shame and embarrassment, which is kind of what irony has become in... Okay, this is kind of just like a kid playing with toy trucks and slamming them around, which I think is great, but also looks pretty weird. Fancy bumping into you here. Out to find some answers about your past, are we? You've quite the familiar face, and using the same powers, but you'll have to forgive me. Do we know each other? <laughs> Same powers? <laughs> Don't make me laugh. Your little dip in that lake has left you a bit rusty. Oh. I've been high and dry for 20 years now. The only rust on me is from the lack of any real challenge. Perhaps you're up for the task. You've already disappointed me. Whenever she poses like that, she just looks like a giant cricket. It's one of the few times that it gets really uncanny valley. This is a moment I've long desired. But you've forgotten your destiny. And wasted the past 20 years. You're right. I do seem to be having trouble remembering things of late. Would you be so kind as to take it from the top? So to speak. Two overseers. The eyes of the world. They are the power behind everything. Jean, as heir to the clan, the time has come for you to prove your right to fight under the Umbra name. You may select opponents of your choice. Then allow me to face the outcast. None! Helen Kiadagat! The child is of impure blood. Challenging her would be a violation of our tenets of faith. It would not be the first time we faced each other. Kiad? Will you face me in this hallowed arena? Well, if I must. But I pray you've got a little something for me in return. You know, I'm very fond of stuffed animals.
Yep, so here we are. This is the first proper boss fight of the game. There are basically two kinds of boss fights. There are fights where you fight Jean in flashbacks or in the present, and there are fights where you fight giant weird angel monsters. Um, but yeah, I gotta say, uh, you know, fighting, fighting your wife with guns and swords and giant magical attacks in insane wizard kung fu battle is a very common form of lesbian flirting. You know, we're all thinking it. This is another one of those fights that takes place in witch time, and um, it can, you know, it just lacking that dodging can be really irritating. I actually got perfect platinum on my practice run, um, so I think there's clearly something to uh, the idea that I'm less good at this when I am trying to talk and play at the same time. Which doesn't bode well, but hopefully I'll get better. Kind of an odd place for the end of it, but good combo, good time. Unfortunate about the damage. Did Jean leave while she was having a flashback? That's so rude! Sean. I noticed she's got her gem back. Did she... Was she given that back in the cutscene? I, I don't recall. So yeah, this is the introduction of the first um, like environmental exploration power, which is Witch Walk, which lets you go up on walls when the moon is out. Also, always remember to smash everything, because sometimes they have useful upgrade items in. Um, very rarely. <laughs> That's not random, it's always fixed. There's a brief combat here, I think. Yet another chunk of Christian folklore for our Pokedex. So this game has a habit, actually, of um, essentially giving you cut attacks in cutscenes that you have to dodge the split second you come out of the cutscene, which is kind of tiresome because there are also quick time events, which, uh, as I'm sure you know, are you know moments in cutscenes when you are expected to suddenly use a button input. Uh, it's a kind of a wet, cheap way to make cutscenes technically the interaction, but it's generally disapproved of as a mechanic by anybody who likes games. Is that the last one? Yeah. See, that's a perfect platinum. Or pure platinum. I don't know why I keep saying perfect. Anyway. Um, so, games of this type, this kind of character action combat games, they tend to have two prime mechanical components, right? They have exploration of a linear path through a level and they also have the combat sequences but they tend not to have such a focus on exploration powers because there's very little exploration to actually do it's usually backtracking or some basic platforming i find it curious that they chose to include quite a few different traversal powers <clears throat> but then not have any interesting ways to combine those powers for the most part or at least in the first half of the game that i've played so far um why bother, really? It's, um... The only thing more frustrating than not having a traversal power is having a traversal power that you can only use specifically and exactly when you are told to, and only on the thing you are told to use it on. An unknown metal wall. Within Old Vigrid, many ancient stone structures have been preserved, being developed further as they are repaired, lending the town a peculiar sense of the historic. Modern architecture has also taken hold in Vigrid, starting with the central station. However, it is all to give form to the sacred institutions of the ancient sages. The architecture gives us a glimpse into the people's deep res respect for their past. This town, of old and new, still keeps within its bounds several strange things that the modern man struggles to make heads or tails of. I wonder if these... Um, notebook asides are so, so clunky because they're just kind of directly translated from the original. Um, which I assume would have been Jap in Japanese, but... These kind of really clunk and are hard to read. For instance, dark green barriers made of an as-yet-unknown metal seem to block certain alleyways. 
Their shape, comprised of many complex bricks, imp impedes one from proceeding down the ancient paths of the city as though they were a rejected visitor, even though it seems these paths saw everyday use in their distant past. I may claim this material is as yet unknown, but in reality I haven't a clue regarding its composi composition. It... That, isn't that redundant? It's harder and heavier than anything a human being is capable of moving, or so I have surmised from examining surf the surface. Pushing one's ear against the wall, the sounds of the other side reverberate and echo within, resounding through the inner workings of the wall as if a glockenspiel were playing scales. I have never seen a metal like this, but many of the walls within the city are made from this material, and from the cliffs one can see an enormous monument constructed from the same mysterious matter. I wonder why these lost witches and sages scattered the walls around the city. So, like a lot of these, this is just explaining a mechanic that we're already familiar with. Um, these, uh, you may have been wondering why it gives you a 10 second countdown that you can intentionally activate, and the answer is because occasionally they will make you do some platforming before you use the thing. It's also necessary in this instance to combine with the, um, to combine the witch walk with smashing the wall because uh, the wall closes again almost immediately. Which, you know, you run to the wall, you smash it open, you can't get through, then you go back again. Like I said, there's a lot of backtracking. I do actually think that, honestly, the streets of Vigrid look delightful. It looked like a very nice place to visit. Uh, the architecture here is much more inspired by just, you know, casual, old-fashioned, Mediterranean, civic architecture. So there's another heart up here, and then there's another one of these. The word witch usually conjures up images in our heads of an old woman using strange magic, but peruse the history of Vigrid and you will find a vastly different picture of incredibly brave women who once inhabited the area. They were known as the Umbra Witches. While these witches are said to have manipulated magic, there remains very little recorded history to back those claims. Yet they shared many powers with their opposing counterparts, the Lumen Sages, and from their records we can gather a better view of what magic entailed. As overseers of history, they possessed the ability to literally see everything in, in, in an instant, also known as temporal control. This technique sharpened all of the five senses and pushed one's emotional energy to its very limits. It is a world where a falling drop of water can become a crown, and a hummingbird slowly and elegantly flaps its wings. Temporal control is not simply being able to recognise the world, it also enables one to boost their physical abilities and move freely within that single moment. Temporal control requires a sound body and mind and complete grasp of spirit energy. While similar, the witches and sages practice this art differently, leading to their respective names for their respective techniques. Witch time and light speed. Witch time. It seems that the witches on this earth fell victim to our world's passage of time and vanished into the abyss of eternity. So, yeah, we're slowly learning stuff about the past. I assume that these flashbacks took place in medieval times, before the witch hunts, because that just makes sense um, timeline-wise. Also, um, some telephones in this game can be used to do cheats, and I don't know which ones because I've never been interested enough to find out, but... Just mentioning that since I found a telephone. Um, yeah, but before I start the fight here, I just want to point out that this is really lusciously designed. It's a lot of effort has gone into making quite a detailed, you know, believable recreation of some Mediterranean streets. And I think that that is, you know, just really nice. It's a pleasant, uh, pleasant, you know, room to stand in for a little while. Although the moment you come over here. Oh, of course, there's a long cutscene first. So this is the introduction to the latest recurring character. Nice little John Woo reference as well. Like I said, this game is thick with references that are kind of arbitrarily applied. us here together and it will never tear us apart police are the same everywhere I guess huh Fuck. That go? 
he's not he's not gone anywhere, he's still there. Pretty bad field of view in that uniform, huh? <laughs> Sayonara. Fleur de cire eau de parfum. Such a wonderful floral bouquet. With its subtle hints of rosemary. You know, in the language of flowers, rosemary equates to remembrance. Which doesn't quite equate to you, now does it? Bayonetta! Shit! Will you stop that? That little Bargonenzo was a nice touch. Seeing you here, I suppose it wasn't the only one. <sighs> You've certainly bloomed, haven't you, my little Cheshire puss? I'm not your pet. The name is Luca. A name you'd better remember. Ah! <laughs> Shit! Damn it! Wait! You can't just run away from me like that! I know what I saw that day! all about your kind. Sure, my colleagues laugh at me for chasing fairy tales, amongst other things. But I know they're real. I know the truth. This smell. the same smell that clung to the air the day my father was murdered. Which means I'm right on your doorstep, Bayonetta. I'll let you in on a little secret, Cheshire. The name is Luke. <laughs> There's no rosemary in the perfume. After all, rosemary is a demon repellent. So I was intending to talk about like camp and you know its position in this game and its position generally and how incredibly camp this game is, but I kind of want to talk about that cutscene first because there's a whole bunch of comments I want to make on it, and unfortunately, it's not really got very many good like places in it to actually start talking about it. Uh, it's really hard to keep track of when it is and isn't quiet, you know? So, again, the references come absolutely, you know, thick and without clear basis. Why is she referencing Alice in Wonderland for, you know, Luca's just, you know, whole shtick? He's not, you know... The Cheshire Cat is, like... If you want to make a reference to Alice in Wonderland, why isn't he Alice? After all, he's, you know, in too deep and is in a world he doesn't understand. Additionally, I really like that he is kind of like... It's interesting how his masculinity is positioned versus Bayonetta's femininity. Bayonetta's just completely untouchable. Her femininity is untouchable and she is untouchable because of her femininity. She's always cool, calm, collected always on top of everything, always stylish, always perfect. Meanwhile, Luca is every inch the archetypical ladies' man, and that is what makes him the comic relief in that sequence, and often in the game in general. He starts in with all of the, you know, um, flirty ladies' man nonsense, and he, it's immediately undercut by knocking him over. There's also a lot of, um, you know, He's trying so hard to be the cool guy, and yet 
he is constantly undercut by the narrative itself and, you know, by the way he's chosen, the, the, the director has chosen to present him. Which is interesting. Um, and it's kind of, um, I think it comes down to something, oh hey, is he taking photos? Was that him? Anyway, there's time for more cutscenes. You only run away so fast because you've got something to run from. Me! But you can't escape me forever! It's also clear that Luca thinks that you killed his dad, but this is kind of the first time that that is mentioned, and it's also very clear that you didn't do it. Um, I don't know if they thought they were being subtle, but it's pretty unambiguous. She even says, you know, like, her perfume isn't the same perfume as the one he smelt when his dad was killed. He can't see angels because he has no spiritual powers, and um, she was in the human world at the time, so clearly... Um, when she broke out of her underwater coffin, um, Angels killed his dad for some reason at the same time, and he just assumed it was her because he could see her. But, uh, what was I talking? I was talking about Luca. So, I wonder if that was, I wonder if that was him. Maybe I should take a Luca round and see if he's still here. Ha <laughs> ha! Um, yep, that is, oh god, is that the first pun? I'm really out of practice, huh? So, in a second, there is going to be a thing. Yep, here it comes. Now, if you jump over this as opposed to um, dodging through it, you actually gain an achievement, I think. And here's the next angel type. So, these guys are pretty clearly inspired by um, one of the angels from traditional uh, Christian folklore, namely the Ophanim which are one of the like three, you know, whatever pop cultural depictions of angels want to use, oh, weird, weird genuine folklore, they use the Ophanim because the Ophanim are the burning wheel guys. But this is a slightly different take on it because normally that's, you know, weird chains floating, weird, like, rounded chained wheels floating in space. This is a slightly different take. For some reason, the, um, the way they chose to make them just... They look very much like the um, the boss on the flag of Sicily for some reason. Why is that? I do not know. Again, this game is full of kind of arbitrary reference that doesn't make much sense to me. Um, it's also interesting because they've chosen to call them enchants rather than... Edit! Medieval Christian folklore pulled these things in, and this is riffing on medieval Christian folklore specifically. But no, you're right, I will. Um, and of course, like, a lot of that medieval Christian folklore, uh, as has been pointed out to me, drew on older Jewish folklore that is, you know, vastly pre-Christian. So I'm going to just go back here and do this, uh, or attempt to do this bonus challenge over here, and then that'll be the end of this episode. But yeah, I think it's interesting because when people are drawing on angel folklore, um, they either go really obvious with it and have winged people, or they go, actually guys, angels are really weird if you actually read the folklore and look it all up. But they seem to have gone for both of them in this, so I don't know what's up with that. Anyway, I cannot complete this challenge no matter how hard I try, which is why I'm narrating over it right now instead of not, so that should be it. I genuinely don't know how you're expected to beat the challenges that so massively limit the number of attacks you can make. They are just kind of impossible to me. Oh, yeah, to me at least, anyway. So, yeah, uh... I think there was something else I wanted to say about Luca based on that cutscene, but it's clear that they're setting up, you know, he thinks you killed his dad, but you just straight up didn't. Um, oh, I tell you what, there is one more of those, so I'm going to go 
take care of that first. But again, just it's lovely how much detail there is in these street scenes, especially since it's just this one mission. You know, you don't come, well. I guess it is for two missions because the next mission takes place in this same area, but after that I don't think we come back here, so it's just kind of a lot of effort has gone to make this lushly detailed recreation of a, you know, Mediterranean street scene. Um, and it's also an interesting departure, therefore, from the previous level, which was so specifically Gaudi focused. So I should be able to beat this one, but it might take me a few tries, which means we're going to cut into post-recorded dialogue here. So this is kind of actually... I think it's the only challenge in the game where there are no additional parameters. The only thing you have to do is defeat all of them within the time limit. It's a little bit longer than most of these challenges are. It gives you a full four minutes instead of the usual three or two. But it can be pretty tight to the time limit because there are a lot of enemies and it is also difficult in a couple of other ways. Um, these challenges tend to disguise their difficulty to some extent. In most of them, you assume that the thing that makes it difficult is the specific bonus parameter challenge. <laughs> also, notice that I suddenly realised I forgot to ever equip my new weapon. So at that moment I switch over and I start doing shotguns on my feet, which I think we can all identify with pretty strongly. Anyway, so although the challenge is ostensibly beat everybody within the time limit, the real challenge is actually beat everybody without getting hit more than three times. Or, in fact, more than two times. Because as soon as you take your third hit, you run out of hit points and you have to start the challenge over. That's a consideration that exists in almost all of these challenges. You have highly limited hit points and, you know, you also have the time limit. So those two challenges do exist for all of these. But, um, honestly, they're just... Like, it's not... there's not a ton to say about this one, unfortunately. Um, but it is, it is incorrect to say that this challenge doesn't have any special considerations or any bonus difficulty, because it, it you know, it limits your, your health massively. One of the useful tricks for this one is simply taking advantage of the uh, torture attacks because angel weapons do so much more damage than your ordinary weapons and torture attacks, you know, drop angel weapons. So you can just, you know, absolutely smash the bejesus out of the weak ones, take their weapons, use those to smash the strong ones, and um, you can get a good chain going. Like, it's not difficult. I did this on my first try, so, you know, just in case you were wondering. I'm not that good at editing. Also, notice that I hit the trumpet ball. If you hit those, they, uh, I think it's always true, but it might only be in witch time. But if you hit them, they turn over to your side and get reflected back at whoever shot them, which comes in very handy occasionally. You might have noticed that I already topped out my combo meter. It maxes out at 9.9, .9, but uh, as far as I know, you can get the actual multiplier, the actual, the actual points number that is being multiplied. Uh, as high as you like. Presumably it caps out at 9999 since there's only uh, four digits on the gauge, but yeah, getting your um, multiplier up is a really great source of rings, which is why I think I mentioned before one of the easy ways to farm rings in this game for casual play purposes if you want to unlock bonus stuff is to go into one of these challenges, get a really high score, and then intentionally fail, or I think you can actually repeat them without failing, so complete it, then do it again, and then complete it, and then do it again. Ones like this are good for that, because they just give you tons of enemies in quick succession in a small arena, so you can build your multiplayer really high, and then sustain it for a long time. Ah, and that looks like that's the end of him. Well, not bad. First try with a minute to spare. Um, I actually kind of frustrated that that didn't take me a few tries, because when I was practicing this it took me about six, and I made about 20,000 rings doing that. One of the um, strategies you can use if you want to farm up a whole bunch of rings, playing this, you know, casually, rather than just for a single playthrough, is uh, that you can just do the same Alfheim portal over and over again, getting huge combo multipliers. Because you can pretty easily get to, uh, at least in that kind of them, you can pretty easily get to um, four to six thousand um, rings per combo, provided you get it up to the maximum 9.9 .9 combo multiplier. So, yeah, that's going to be it for now, and I will catch you later. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and there's links to my other projects in the description. Thank you so much for watching.